source of prophet in the Old Testament sense would be Nabe. The word of the Lord bubbles up and comes forward. Okay. Um, and so in the prophetic, a person may hear the word of the Lord and speak what they hear. Um, a seer, um, his receptive function is primarily seen. And so, um, generally when, okay, generally when I've heard people talk about prophets, when I think of the continuum, I think of um, first the First Corinthians chapter 12, simple gift of prophecy. And, you know, which would be for First Corinthians 14, you know, for edification, for comfort, exhortation. Um, but then I, I think that as one, you know, rises at the level of the prophetic, um, the words become more um, They're, they're less generalized uh, and they become more directed. So, you know, you like to have the simple gift of prophecy and then um, you have, for lack of just to be a descriptive, not necessarily be doctrinal, but to be descriptive, you have prophetic gifting that's a little stronger than um, the simple gift of prophecy and then you have prophetic ministry and then you have the office of the prophet. Okay. Um, to me. Everybody say Tony's opinion. Tony's opinion. Now when I say Tony's opinion, that means you give the weight, you give the weight of what I say as an opinion. And nothing more than an opinion. Okay. Um, when I look at quote prophets, I look at ranks and I would say Jesus is the first order of prophet. <laughs> wow. Okay. Then the second order of prophet that I would say is the old covenant prophets. Third rank would be the new Testament prophets and whoever has would have authority and grace to write scripture and then I would say the fourth rank would be prophets of today and I would I would not in my opinion would not rank them with Jesus I wouldn't I would not rank them with the old covenant apostles I, I mean prophets I would not rank them with the new covenant prophets I would rank them fourth that what they say has to be in agreement with what is written. Okay? And so I would not give them I opinion would give them the same right. Just me. Okay, so in connection with that, when I look at apostles, Jesus is the apostle. Huh. Right? Then I would look at the twelve apostles of the Lamb as the second rank who walked with Jesus for three years, three and a half years. And then I would look at the third rank, those who didn't walk with Jesus but were still apostles, of which Paul would fit into that, who could write scripture. Then I would look at apostles today, who what they say and do must be in line with uh, the truth of Scripture. Okay. Most of the books that I have read that have dealt with quote the prophet, generally speaking, have to do with different aspects of prophetic ministry. For example, uh, musical prophets, Asaph, Haman, uh, David. The prophetic as it has to do with the song of the Lord. Or um, to be descriptive, prophetic evangelism as in Jonah. Okay? Um, to be descriptive. And no side, I'm not being theolo theological, I'm being descriptive. As in uh, Elihu. Remember, you had Job's three friends, and then you had Elihu, who really gives them the counsel of God, and after that, God shows up. <laughs> so there's prophetic counsel. Um, um, and after that, the person of God or the presence of God appears. Okay. And so when you're looking at prophetic counsel, you're looking at sometimes spiritual, mental, emotional healing. You're looking at deliverance, but you're looking at the word of the Lord. Then when I think about um, prophets, I look at um, prophets that are like Samuel, which um, are sort of senior prophets. Mm father prophets or mother prophets. And while I'm on that, um, there were five things you had to do to be in the uh, 
to stay, to be in and stay in Samuel's School of the Prophets. This is a good lesson for everyone. Um, one would be you had to learn the first five books of Moses. Everybody said that was the Bible. <laughs> that was the Bible. <laughs> so in other words, to be in the ministry, to be in the ministry. That, you had to know the word of the Lord. You had to know the word of the Lord. And by the way, um, King David, um, Samuel was his prophetic father, his ministry father, his spiritual father. Uh, when he gets in trouble with King Saul, who does he run to? Samuel. Okay. Number two, they had to master a musical instrument. <laughs> That's why when the prophet Samuel is saying to Saul, you're going to come to a company of prophets, and he gives a description of the musical instruments that they had. What it represents, what it symbolizes is you have to be a worshiper. Man, come on. The revelation of the word will provoke you to worship. Awesome. When you worship, it provokes God to oh reveal himself. Oh, my God. Wow. Okay. Number three, you had to study the poetry and the, and the prose of Moses. Okay, what does that represent? That represents knowing the language of God. So how the Lord talks to you may not be how he talks to me. But I've got to discover the language in which the Lord talks to me. Okay? And um, so in order to be a prophetic son, less out of the office of a prophet, but to be a prophetic son, to be a prophetic daughter, to be a son or daughter of God, I've got to be prophetic. I've got to learn the, how, the language of God, how the Lord talks to me. Yeah. Okay? Number four, um, the, the quote, sons of the prophets, they live together in a community, which means you have to learn team ministry. So Paul later on says, let the prophets speak to, or what? Three. And if the second one got a revelation, let the first one shut up. <laughs> Look at somebody say, learn how to work as a team. Learn how to work as a team. And then the fifth thing that they had to do was they had to learn how to be, in a, be under delegated authority. And so there comes a point where it says that the prophets were prophesied under the leadership of Samuel. Huh. Okay. Generally speaking, when you read books on the prophetic, and I haven't read them all, but I've read a few. Most of them deal with various aspects of the prophetic, but I'm very interested in what, what struck me as really curious is none of them talked about how prophets built the church. And yet Matthew 16, Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And that struck me as curious, especially in light of Paul who says in Ephesians, you know, basically 2.20, he says, you know what, uh, you're not strangers. You're not aliens, but you're part of the household of God. Okay? You're part of the commonwealth of Israel in Christ Jesus. And you are built, everybody say it, built, built, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, mm. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So when you say to me, what is a prophet? I don't think of a prophet so much as a person who moves in the word of knowledge, the word mm. of wisdom, discerning spirits of prophecy. I think of a prophet more as a spiritual father or a spiritual mother mm -hmm. who's able to give birth to spiritual wow. sons and daughters and then nurture those sons and daughters, yeah. love them, give them discipline, give them balance, raise them up to maturity and release them. Mm -hmm. And then become a spiritual grandpa or a spiritual gr grandfather, right. <laughs> grandfather, grandmother. Mm -hmm. I look at builders. So when Paul says um, in Corinthians, uh, according to the grace of God that's given to me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Remember now, the foundation is built upon the apostles and the prophets. Right? He says, as a wise master builder, you go look at the word, it's architeion. Architect. So a person who's a true apostle is an architect. A person who's a true prophet is they're an architect. Hmm. Well, what's an architect do? Look at somebody and say, he builds. He builds. Yeah. Now, when I say he Please understand, I'm being genderless. So be, everybody say, he and she is all in he right now. <laughs> okay? 
So, okay, so what, what, what does that mean? Well, an architect, before he even digs the foundation, he begins with the end in mind. Mm. See, okay, let me give you the difference between a mature prophet and an immature prophet, a mature apostle and an immature apostle. And here's my question. Is he on the roof or is he in the foundation? Hmm. If he's immature, he's on the roof. Hmm. If he's mature, he's in the foundation and you probably don't even know who he is. Hmm. He's not seen because he's pushing everybody up. Oh, man. So... A lot of the times when we think of prophets, we measure how good a prophet is by how specific and how detailed their word of knowledge is, their word of wisdom. Yeah. Can you give me my name? Can you give me my telephone number? Can you give me my address? Okay. And? But now, can I preach and teach you the word? Can I give you a prophetic preach? Come on. A prophetic teach? that's going to build you up in Christ Jesus and going to help you assume your place because you are living stone. Hmm. Right? And you need to get in your place in the living stone building of Jesus Christ. And so, from a ministry perspective, prophetic persons um, are persons, okay, Okay. Why we're on this? <laughs> um, okay. Most prophetic, and you'll find this to be true. Most prophetic words are in the realm of vision. Vision speaks to where you're going. Most prophetic words are not in the realm of administration, which has to do with wisdom and the sequential steps you got to take to cause vision to become reality. Mm -hmm. So I can give you a word of knowledge and a word of prophecy and say, by affirmation and confirmation with the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, this is where you're going. Okay? But you know what? It would be better if you and I had a relationship where I could be a prophetic father to you and then I could start giving you more than foresight where you're going and give you insight and say, look, Boy, you don't want to do that. I did that. That ain't going to take you where you want to go. <laughs> you should do this. So what you have is that you have people who are talking to Jesus. Somebody prophetic comes and gives them a word. And they say to themselves, well, I got a word. This is where I'm going. I'm going to get there. And then you wonder why prophecies fail. Wow. Because you got a word from the Lord. This is where you're going. Oh, that's the starting point. Now I need the counsel of God. Mm. The wisdom of God. What are the sequential steps I have to take right. in order to get from here to there? Yeah. Yeah, and so, the re the, so there's a problem because we don't have, if I can say it like this, prophetic relationships. Hmm. When I say prophetic relationships, I'm not necessarily talking about prophets. I'm talking about having older brothers and older sisters in Jesus. Okay? Spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, whether they be pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, or apostles, who can say to you, hey, you want to get there? You need to do this. Not that. Uh, because uh, okay, let me let me help you on let me, let me help you get something. Okay, and I'm going to make a statement that probably 90% of you in this room are not going to accept. Yeah. But I don't really care. <laughs> it's still true. You ready? And I know you're not going to accept it, but it's okay. Look at somebody and say, you're going to chew on this next statement. You're going to chew on this next statement. You ready for me? Ready. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Things don't go wrong. They start wrong. Mm. Because the seeds of destruction are always in the foundation. <laughs> oh my they don't go wrong. They start wrong. The seeds of destruction are always in the beginning. So when I see a person who's got a problem up here, oh, I know the problem is really down here. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong in their foundation. Mm -hmm. So what does a prophetic father, a prophetic mother, or a pastoral father, mother, evangelist, apostle, whatever, father and mother, what do we do? We lay foundation. Now, here's where you need to step back. What are foundations? Foundations are conclusions. Mm. 
So what, what is a prophet? A prophet is a person who builds God's conclusions into your life. Because that's what foundations are. God's conclusions. Okay. Hebrews 12. Jesus is the what? Author and the finisher. finisher. Everybody say foundation. Foundation. And conclusion. And conclusion. So when I walk up to this woman in this wheelchair, she gives me the doctor's conclusion. She says, I'm in pain all over my body. He says that I will always have pain and I will never walk again. Okay. Her foundation is on that conclusion. So what the first thing I do is I say, okay, well, I've got to give her a different foundation and a different conclusion. Come on. So the first thing I do is I say, it is written. Yeah. I got a different conclusion for you. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what I did? I started giving her a different conclusion. Because faith has to have a foundation, and the foundation for faith is God's conclusion. Yes. Come on. Okay? See, so so what is your life actually built on? Your actually your built your life is built on conclusions and foundations. Everybody say Alpha, Alpha and, Omega. and Omega. Omega. Beginning. Beginning. Ending. ending. First, First. Last. Last. Foundation. 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 Conclusion. Conclusion. So now let me ask you a question to make you think. What if you got a wrong conclusion? Then you're going to have a wrong foundation. What if you got a wrong foundation? You're going to have a wrong conclusion. Because you have foundations, conclusions, and you make decisions based upon your foundations and conclusions. So if you got a wrong foundation and a wrong conclusion, you're going to make a wrong decision. Mm. If you make a wrong decision, you're going to move in the wrong direction. Yeah. If you move in the wrong direction, you're going to reach a wrong destiny. <laughs> so, what does a prophet do? A prophet gives you the word of the Lord and gives you biblical, scriptural foundations and conclusions. You make decisions on the, on God's foundations and conclusions that set you in right direction so that you can reach destiny. Why? Because your destiny requires a diet. Hmm. Okay. Back up. <laughs> you have the original man in the Garden of Eden, yes? Yes. God says to the man and the woman, Every tree of the garden, hey, you can eat it, but see that one tree over there? That'd be my tree. <laughs> God's African American right now, you know. <laughs> that be my tree. I set a boundary. Okay? That tree is my tree. You can eat from any tree, leave that tree alone. That's my boundary for your well being. Mm. A conclusion is always a boundary. <laughs> For your health and well-being. Mm. Satan, by nature, is a boundary breaker. Yeah. So what he did, does is, is he deceives the woman. And when he gets the woman, he convinces the man to break a boundary. They eat from a tree. That is forbidden. The knowledge of good and evil. Now watch this. Okay. Hebrew word for iniquity is what your eyes hook into grows and multiplies in you. The first thing the enemy does is says, hey sis, look at that tree. He directs and gets her eyes to hook into the tree. (laughs) Then the word says, she saw the tree, that it was good for food. Now desire is growing in her. Because what you focus on and fasten and fix your eyes on, desire is created. A tree desired to make one wise. So whatever your eyes hook into multiplies and grows in you. Then what does she do next? She takes the fruit of the tree and does what? Eat it. Yeah, diet. What she don't realize is the enemy who has said to her, The Lord don't want you to eat from that tree because you will be as gods. She, Adam and Eve were already as God. First of all, she quotes, she misquotes the word of the Lord. You should not eat it, but she says, you should not touch it. So the the enemy says, you ain't going to die because he knows when she touches it because she don't know the word. 
She don't die. She says, well, what else? God ain't told me that. Mm -hmm. But notice this. When she eats it, everybody say diet. Diet. Destiny. 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 Wrong foundation, wrong conclusion, wrong decision, wrong direction, wrong destiny. What the enemy said to her, that her eyes hooked into, that grew in her, was a diet that determined the destiny. Wrong conclusion. She accepted a conclusion other than the conclusion God gave her. So what do prophets do? They give you God's conclusions. That's what all five-fold ministry does. Okay, your okay, your destiny requires a specific diet. Your destiny and my destiny are not the same. So the diet that God has for me is unique to me. <laughs> the diet God has for you is unique to you. But if you don't get that diet, you won't reach your destiny. So. Okay. Back up from that. So, what are what what do prophets do? Prophets help you identify personal and ministry identity. Okay. Um. That's these are okay. Everything I said are messages. Each statement's a message in and of itself. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying to you? Now, why did I hold Eric back? Because we want to have glory without a foundation. I'm not saying he does. I'm saying people want to enter and experience the glory without a foundation. And I'm saying you need a foundation for the glory. That's powerful. So I'm saying that... um, Let me, I'm going to challenge. Okay. We think of maturity in terms of how long you've been saved. That's what we think of. However, the Hebrew writer says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Sequence. Because when you build, do I have any construction people in here? You build by sequence. Before you even build, you get an architectural design. Huh. <coughs> right? Uh-huh. And in mind. Then you got to get permission to build. You just can't go out and just build. Look at somebody say, truth is parallel. Truth is parallel. <laughs> you just can't go out and just do what you want to do. You need a, pay- a building permit. Look at somebody say, the word of God is your building permit. The word of God is your building permit. Look at somebody say, your calling is your building permit. Your calling is your building permit. Your gifting is your building permit. Your gifting is your building permit. See, okay, can I can I get worldly with you, but you'll get the, you know, remember that worldly statement? Y'all young people get this. Who's your daddy now? Okay? Who's your spiritual daddy? Okay? Who fathered you in this gospel? Who's raising you? Who are you responsible to? Do they think you're ready to go? Because we always think, you know, when you, when you, you know, you always think you're ready before your parent does. You always think you're grown before your parent does. I mean, you know, when I was 16, I, I was wondering, how does somebody so brilliant come from such stupid people? <laughs> come on now, let's get for real. Some of y'all don't forgot. <laughs> They got, they, got, they got a whole lot smarter when I was about 23. <laughs> Intelligence just, had, just did a quantum leap. <laughs> so, then when, they, when you do get permission to build, they build in sequence. And see, what I'm trying to get you to think about is this. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Most of what we do in ministry we focus on ministry that blesses. Okay, there's two legitimate types of ministry in the earth, in the body of Christ. Ministry that blesses and ministry that builds. I have to bring the blessing to you to build you. <laughs> but if I don't get to the point of building, okay, Ephesians 4. God gives what? 
apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. To what? Quote, to do what? And about build. <laughs> build. I don't I haven't read a prophetic book yet that talks about prophets as builders. Not a one. There's got to be some out there, but I ain't read it. You know, it's all flash, all glamour, all all glitz. It's all gifting. It's all anointing. It's all ministry. It's not. It's not fathering or mothering. It's not relational. Okay. It's not about. It's about the prophet, not about the body. Man. Okay. So, um, again, my issue. So when you ask me the question, I'm thinking to myself. But see, it's not, it's not the people's fault. It's our fault that are ministers. So, because see, we think we think crazy stuff, and this is the kind of crazy stuff we think. If I could just be anointed enough, mm-hmm. if I could just be gifted enough, mm-hmm. I'm going to be successful in ministry. Mm-hmm. So you you sat up here praying crazy prayers. <laughs> Lord bless my ministry. The Lord ain't interested in your ministry. <laughs> the Lord is not interested in blessing your ministry. He's interested in you blessing His ministry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See the shift? Mm-hmm. See the shift? Mm-hmm. You're trying to get God to bless what you're doing. If you bless what he's doing, he's, he's already doing something. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, okay. See, a lot of your praying has to do with what's important to you. Mm-hmm. You ever say, Lord, what's important to you? Mm-hmm. What are you saying and what are you doing? Okay, I want you. I'm going to make you think. Aren't you curious why I didn't pray for a whole bunch of people today? Yes. Mm-hmm. Didn't you wonder? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I'll tell you why. Because I was only going to join the Father in what He was doing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. Jesus. So what I was looking for? Okay, Father, what are you doing? Jesus, what are you doing? I'm going to join you. Now, does that mean I won't pray for people because they come for prayer? Sure, I'll give you a courtesy prayer. <laughs> for real, seriously. And if you got faith, God will answer it. But there are times when you don't do that. You just say, Jesus said the Son could do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father is doing, the Son does what? Likewise. And so there are times when, okay, okay, there are times when you're trying to make things happen, Mm -hmm. but in the glory you don't try to make anything happen. Oh my. (laughs) In the glory you don't try to make anything happen, you watch what has already happened. And you bring it from the invisible into the visible. Yes. Gentile faith is not the same thing as Hebrew faith. You heard me, but you didn't hear me. I promise you, you didn't even understand what I just said. Are y'all Gentiles? Yes, sir. You didn't understand what I said. Now, I know I appear ignorant. But I'm going to prove to you you didn't understand what I said. Your problem is the same problem I have because I'm a Gentile. But I work with Jewish people. My past is Jewish. Ren is Jewish. His father was Jamaican. His mother was Jewish, which makes him Jewish. by Jewish law. <laughs> Jesus was Jewish. Not because Joseph was his daddy, because Joseph wasn't his daddy. Joseph was his stepdaddy. God was the father of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is Jewish because his mama was Jewish. <laughs> Your problem is the same problem I got. You are reading a Middle Eastern book with a Western mindset. You are backwards. 
Look at somebody smile and say, I've been wanting to tell you that for quite some time. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me show you something. Okay. What people try to, what Gentiles try to, because I believe me. What, okay, here's, okay. okay. All right. The Gentile reads, reads from left to right. The Jewish person reads from what? Right to left. So I'm going to show you how a Jewish person in Jesus interprets Hebrews 11 and 1. Can I show you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to have fun doing this because I like to do stuff for my entertainment. Your name is of things. What's your name? <laughs> of things. Very good. Now faith is the substance. Of things. Your name is hope for. What's your name? Hope for. Now faith is the substance. Of things. Hope for. Your name is the evidence. What be your name? The evidence. Now faith is the substance. Of things. Hope for. The evidence. Your name is of things. What's of, your name? Of things. Now the substance of things. Go for it. The evidence of things. Your name is not seen. Not seen. <laughs> now faith is the substance of things. Go for it. Of evidence of things. Not seen. What's your name? Of evidence. Not evidence. <laughs> the evidence. Yeah, I want to make sure you get your name right. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening is this: people are trying to believe God. To make something happen. Come on. Mm -hmm. Now faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. But a Hebrew mind don't think like that. Yeah. Well, it is written, I'm the Lord that heals you. It is written, the Lord takes disease away from you. It is written, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, Jesus said, he'll give it to you. Everybody say, the word of God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. Not seen. Everybody say the word of God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. Not seen. The word of God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. Not seen. The word of God is the truth. It's just not seen. But it's a of things. It's a real thing. It's just not seen. With his stripes we are. Come on. The word of God is the Truth. It's just not seen, but it's a real thing. The reason you know it's true, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Everybody said, the word is the truth. The, the word, word is the truth. truth. It's the truth, even though it's not, not seen. seen. It's a real thing. thing. And the evidence is the evidence. The word is the evidence <laughs> that it's true. That it's a real thing, though invisible. Not Sorry. seen. <laughs> Something has been done. When you accept the word of God as having already happened, even though it's not seen, it's a real thing. And the word is your evidence. Something is happening now. Yes. What's your name? Hopefully. 
now something is happening to what you're hoping for. Something is happening. The word of God is the truth. It's an unseen thing, but it's already totelestah. Finished. It's a real thing, but it's invisible. The word is your evidence. It's already happened. By his wounds you were healed. Yeah, come on. Amen. But you're hoping for it to move from being an invisible thing to a visible thing. And because you've accepted as an unseen real thing and the word is your evidence is already true, what's your name? Okay. Now it becomes a physical, visible thing. Yeah, come on. And when it becomes a visible, physical thing, the word has now become substance. Come on. And now. <laughs> <laughs> so you are not believing for something to happen you believe that something has already happened Come on, and so then God responds to your faith with anointing and glory yes. <laughs> why because you have reached his conclusion yes <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you got it? Yes, sir. So, when you accept God's foundation and God's conclusion, and you make a decision based on that, it moves you in a certain direction that causes you to step into destiny. See, whenever I see somebody who's trying to believe to make something happen, Hmm. Oh, I know you're in trouble. <laughs> My God. You're in trouble. Because you have put faith in the future. What? No, faith is. <laughs> but see, here's your first clue. See, <laughs> here's, here's Isaiah, what, seven, eight hundred years before Jesus comes and says in Isaiah 53, who's going to believe this report? <laughs> who's going to believe this report? <laughs> Wounded. He was wounded. Well, for your transgressions. He was. Wait a minute, this 700, 800 years before he arrived. You asked me about the prophetic. Testimony of Jesus. This brother is talking about a future event like it's already. Because he's got a foundation of a conclusion. Uh. Don't believe what I'm fixing to say. <laughs> he was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities. The punishment that brought you peace was placed upon him. And because of what he done did, by his stripes we are what? Healed. Yeah. Healed. But Peter knew we was going to have problems, so he just decided I'm just going to make it real clear. By his wounds you were. Yeah. 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 Uh. So you trying to believe for something to happen that's already gosh okay the glory comes upon what you believe has already happened the power turns the invisible to the visible when you believe it's already happened power represents anointing Mm. Everybody say faith, faith, faith anointing, anointing, glory. Give it to glory. So when you have the glory, the power comes out of the glory. We call that anointing, and causes what is invisible to become visible. But you got to believe that it's already happened. Then the glory comes and power comes out of it and causes what you believe has already happened, though unseen, it becomes seen right before your eyes. That's our problem. You try to believe for something to happen. You try to make it happen. Mm. Instead of seeing in the realm of the spirit, it has already happened. In the realm of God, eternity, it's already happened. When you accept that it's already happened, you bring it from eternity the time. Okay. Mm. 
Look at somebody say, Ever eternity invades time. Eternity invades time. Okay. Okay. I'll say, I don't know. Okay, I think I will go here. So anyway, um, I was having a heavenly experience and I was in the library of heaven. I don't like to talk too much about these things. Occasionally I will. Uh, I was in the library of heaven and a book was open. And the Lord was talking to me about time. Now I'm going to make a statement. Okay, You have to understand that faith, anointing, and glory can break the law of time. Man. That, okay, anytime a miracle happens, the law of time is broken. Mm. Mm. Wow. When a miracle happens, God does one of three things with time. He either suspends it, turns it back, or moves it forward. Exodus 3, Moses sees a bush catch on fire. It's no, it's no wonderful thing to catch on fire in a desert in the Middle East where combustible things burn, but this thing didn't burn out. It just burns and keeps burning. It gets Moses' attention. It ain't burning out. What's up? He walks over there to experience a theophany, a God manifestation. Mm -hmm. Everybody say a glory manifestation. Glory manifestation. Wait a minute. It's to Moses, you know what struck Moses? That thing in time is supposed to burn out, but it ain't burning uh -huh. out. Uh -huh. Look at somebody say, it's, it's almost, see, it's all, to Moses it was like time stood still. Mm -hmm. It just kept burning and burning and burning. And then the God manifestation, the theophany, the angel of the Lord, God himself, is talking out of this thing that's just burning and burning and burning. Wow. Everybody say, time stood still. Time, time stood still. Now this is important because time's going to stand still in the life and ministry of Moses. Huh. You got a glory cloud during the day. You got a pillar of fire, which is the glory at night. Yes. You got folk walking around in the desert for 40 years in the same clothes that don't get old. <laughs> Look at somebody said, time has just stood still. The time has just stood still. <laughs> Shoes that don't wear out. Everybody said, time has stood still. Time has stood still. Now, here's the mystery. How can time be going on and time stand still? <laughs> Look at somebody said, the law of time is broken. The law of time is broken. In the realm of eternity. In the realm of eternity. In the realm of God. In the realm of God. Catch this. Where Moses entered, and where Moses walked, and where Moses lived. I fasted 40 days and 40 nights. It's impossible to go 40 days and 40 nights without drinking liquid. Moses does it for 80 days. That's not possible unless... Where he was in the glory, there was no time. I'm making you think. Why is this foundational? Because, why is this foundational? Because when God stops time, he creates matter, he changes matter, or he destroys matter. Mm -hmm. Throw that stick down. <laughs> it becomes a snake. Everybody say, the matter has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Matter has changed. Gosh. Pick up the stick by the tail. Now, the Bible don't say how many times God had to talk to Moses <laughs> to pick up the stick. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I would have been in Syria by that time. <laughs> hey! Translate that brother back here. <laughs> he don't move. He picks it up by the tail. It becomes a stick again. Everybody say, God has changed the matter. 
God has changed the matter. Put your hand in, puts it in, brings it out, it becomes white as snow. Put it back in, boom, God changes matter. When you get down there to Egypt, grab some water, it's going to become blood. Look at somebody say, the law of time is broken. The law of time is broken. Every time he obeys God, every time he obeys God, the law of time is broken and God suspends the laws of physics. Okay. Now, Joseph, Joseph, Joshua, who's one of his disciples, learns a lesson. So God says, you're going to destroy this enemy. But the sun is going down. So he says, son, don't you even go anywhere. Don't think about it. Moon, you better be staying right where you at. Everybody said, time is suspended. Yeah. Time is suspended. To cause the miracle. To cause the miracle. Of what God said. Of what God said. To become reality. To become reality. Okay, so God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and says, King Hezekiah, your time is up. Set your house in order. You're going to die and not live. King Hezekiah says, you know what? I'm going to turn my face to the wall and I'm going to really pray. God speaks to the prophet and says, hey, go back. I saw the man humble himself. He's crying with tears. Go back and tell him he got 15 years. Ask him if he wants the sundial representing time to move forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees. King Hezekiah said the time is always moving forward. Turn it back to him. When God turns it back to him, God adds on to him. 15 years. Wow. Everybody say, when God does a miracle, when God does a miracle. Everybody say, He suspends time. He suspends time. He turns time back. Turns time back. Or moves time forward. I have a question for you. How is it, Jonah, when he comes up out of that well after he done repented, makes a three days journey on a first day's walk? Talk to me, somebody. You can't do three days in one day walking unless God has accelerated. You mean tell me Elijah's going to outrun King Ahab in his chariot for 18 miles? <laughs> <laughs> unless God has accelerated. Uh, unless Elijah ran from the natural into the supernatural realm. <laughs> See, you know, we ought to just think about words. Okay. The natural is time. If the natural is time, what's the souped up natural? <laughs> okay? So that's what I'm saying to you. So if you don't have an understanding of God's ability to suspend, see, here's your first clue. How does God actually introduce himself to Moses? I am. I will be what I will be. I am. Yesterday I am. Today I am. Tomorrow I am. I'm just going to be. I will be what I will be. He's introducing himself as someone who stands outside of time. Yeah. And invades time to do whatever he pleases. So if you do what I tell you. I will take dominion over time. I'll break the law of physics to cause what I said to come to pass. All you have to do is walk with me. And say what I tell you to say. And do what I tell you to do when I tell you to say it and when I tell you to do it. Look at somebody say, it's so simple. It's so simple. <laughs> So, that's what I'm saying to you. Next question. <laughs> <laughs>